It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Joe Lurie. Hey, Joe, how are you? Good. How are you doing today, Douglas? Ah, doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be with you. So let's see, looking at your bio, uh, executive director, how do you say that? Emeritus. Emeritus. Okay, and I assume that means retired? It does. It means retired <coughs> with it. It's kind of an honorific. It's, you know, when you retire and they think you did a decent job, they'll tack that on. Okay. Retired from that position, but I don't believe in retirement because uh, you know the phrase, retire to what? <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Okay, so what are you you're doing now? What are you, You're writing books? You've got a book out? Yeah, I mean, when I retired from uh, working at the uh, International House at UC Berkeley, I wanted to continue my exploration of other cultures, uh, misunderstandings and miscommunications across and within cultures. So I wrote a book. Uh, I do cross-cultural communication training for a variety of organizations. You know, every single sector, I think, in my view, can benefit from understanding what we don't understand, particularly in an age of globalization. So, um, you know, working with refugees, uh, trying to help them to find uh, work in this country, writing a book, doing intercultural training, that's kind of sums it up. Okay. Well, this is an interesting topic for me um, because I did spend some time out of the United States. I spent three years in Thailand teaching English uh, back in the early 2000s. And I tell you, I learned probably more than my students ever did. And there is this sort of vast... We think we're kind of all the same now, right? Because of the Internet, because everybody speaks Windows... Everybody has a, a smartphone, everybody's online, but there are cultural differences amongst peoples that are great. And the misunderstandings I had with my students over there are laughable at this point. All right, so I know this is a big topic to unpack, but well, where do you want to start? You want to start with the Peace Corps? You were in the Peace well, Corps you know, one time. Yeah, that's, where, that's really kind of where my awakening to these differences occurred. Uh, and then it just kind of shot me in my um, in a career direction that was enormously satisfying to me, and I continue to learn about cultural differences in every single conceivable way, whether it's gestures, tone of voice, politesse. Um, you know, one man's meat is a another man's poison is a cliche, but in many ways it is very true. And sometimes it gets us into trouble because just because someone is different doesn't mean that they. They uh, are mil being malicious towards you or they don't like you. It's just a question of, I don't understand your reality and you don't understand mine. If I could just briefly illustrate this with a very brief story, uh, Douglas. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, I had all kinds of awakenings in Kenya when I was a Peace Corps volunteer teaching and doing all kinds of other projects, just as you did uh, when you were teaching in Thailand. And uh, when I came back from uh, my experiences in Kenya, I remember uh, walking in Central Park in New York City with a colleague, and she has, was with her daughter, two, two and a half year old daughter, uh, for the first time in Central Park. And the daughter looked up and saw a bird flying in Central Park and said to her mother, Mommy, where is that bird's cage? <laughs> And so, you know, th th this is the first time that the child had ever seen a bird f flying freely. In, in their home, they had a bird in a cage. So for me, this is a metaphor for all of us. I don't care how well re you are or I am, how well-traveled. All of us are in a cage of limitations from our own experience and our own culture. And the excitement of this is to get outside the cage and learn that you can actually fly by you experiencing other realities. Well, I think that's a good point, and I think it's sort of ironic that since we are all connected at the tip of a finger through the Internet, that we haven't progressed much. At least I don't think so. 
What do you think? Do you think the internet has helped uh, well, you know, or not? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just I think you know it, it's a mixed bag. Um, the fact that it's happening so quickly for me is speeding up the absence of context. I mean, you know, in essence, what is what causes misunderstanding? Not only that each of us doesn't have the other person's experience or culture in mind, but it's also an absence of context. We don't have a larger picture. So, for example, the Internet speeds things up enormously, right? So when you text somebody, it enlarges the dangers of absence of context. You don't have a full picture. You don't have the tone. I mean, you and I, I am assuming, we, we grew up where we could try to clarify, as difficult as that would be sometimes, by telephone, by conversation, right? Right. Now, now because everything is so rapid, messages are being reduced, you know, an email, email is too long for many people nowadays. So even an email is an absence of context, and then you reduce that to a text or an emoji, and that emoji can be perceived differently. So I, I do think that there is a tremendous uh, disconnect that globalization causes. Let me give you an example from even intergenerationally. Um, you and I probably, as we enter the world of texting and these abbreviations, LOL. What does LOL mean to you, Doug, uh, Douglas? Uh, laughing out loud. Okay. Okay, so uh, my niece, uh, was, I was interviewing her about how she communicates or doesn't communicate effectively with people of my generation or uh, people even of um, a much older generation. I'm 78 right now, right? And she's 20. And uh, she was telling me that her mother, who's in her 50s, when she first texted LOL, the mother interpreted it as lots of love. <laughs> okay. Right. So because each of us, in a sense, you know, we, we, we generally, we see what we look for and we hear what we listen for. And so because of the limitations of our experience, each one of us, there is this confirmation bias. I mean, we see it playing out not only interpersonally, intergenerationally, but unfortunately, in my mind, politically, uh, where so many things are being polarized by the bubble that we're in and that we tend to follow things that confirm our beliefs. Oh, exactly. Well, then, I mean, I know I'm jumping right to the end of this thing, but <laughs> isn't it, okay. doesn't it seem like it would be almost impossible then to get the world to unite and agree? Uh, because you're, where do you start? Do you start with religion? Do you start with political ideology? Do you start, I mean, where in the world do you start? Even language, how about that? Can we agree... Uh, on planet Earth to only speak one language from now on? Yeah, that would take a, many, 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 uh, <laughs> many centuries, I think. Um, and I think it's okay. Languages are fascinating because, you know, one word, a, a word in one language can have a totally different meaning in another, even in English. So, for example, in the United States, when we want to table an issue, um, what would you say? If I said you and I are in a business negotiation and I said, let's table this, what does that mean? It means let's finish it. Let's let's decide what we're going to do and resolve it. Yeah, let's put it. Yeah, let's or let's put it off, let's, right? Or let's put it, it off. Down. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the British means something totally different. When you table an issue, it means let's deal with it now. Oh, okay. All right. See? So um, you know, I'll, I'll quickly come to where I think some of the remedies are, but maybe uh, if we can talk a little bit about some of these cultural differences that you and I have experienced, uh, and then maybe move towards, well, what are some of the ways to, to bridge these differences? It might make more sense and might be more compelling to give some of the remedies after we highlight some of the... Uh, uh, yeah, okay, good idea. So you were asking me about my Peace Corps days. So, you know, this is where my awakening started. And I think one of the really striking things when I was in the Peace Corps, we were all learning Swahili, uh, because we're going to East Africa, where Swahili is a... Uh, it's actually a second language for most people, but it's a, a lingua franca in most of um, East Africa. So we were learning Swahili six hours a day, no English. And I realized then, of course, that that's how young children, you know, babies, learn language. They're total immersion, right? <laughs> right. And um, all of a sudden, after one of our, my early Swahili classes, uh, my Swahili instructor came up to me, started a conversation, and was holding my hand. 
Now, Douglas, full disclosure, I'm heterosexual. So in the United States, when a man holds your hand for a while, and I'm talking about 20 minutes, okay, 20 minutes, uh, I was feeling very uncomfortable with that as a heterosexual. But I was reluctant to do anything about it in the moment because I was afraid, gee, maybe I'll offend him, maybe I'll be thrown out of the Peace Corps. Long story short, Douglas, hand-holding has nothing to do with homosexuality in most parts of Africa, many parts of the Middle East, parts of Asia. Zero. And so and it's culturally defined. And in effect, you know, it took me about three or four months that when I was in Kenya walking down the, uh, you know, walking in the village or um, seeing uh, my Kenyan friends that they would hold hands with me as we were walking and talking, I got used to it after about three or four months. It took a while, right? I got so used to it, Douglas, that when I came back to the United States, I did not know what to do with my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I told this to a Nigerian friend of mine, where, as I said, uh, you know, in most parts of Africa, men, uh, men holding hands really has no sexual significance at all. And he said, you know, that's funny, Joe, because, you know, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and many of your listeners may know that there's a... Um, there's a um, neighborhood in San Francisco called the Castro, which is, you know, primarily an LGBT area. And so my Nigerian friend said he, when he first came to settle in San Francisco, he wanted to show a Nigerian friend of his what the Castro was like. So in their reality, they were holding hands as heterosexual men, but shaped by their Nigerian approach to this. And they could not believe how many people were trying to hit on them because they were holding hands. It was a total reversal, you know, total yeah. reversal. Um, just one, uh, you know, there's so many. I wrote a whole chapter on this. I'll just give you one, one other example of this. When I was in the market uh, shopping, I'd often noticed that children would refer to many, more than one, maybe sometimes two or three women, elder, you know, in their 30s, 40s, or 50s, with the word mama. And the same thing if they'd see men, uh, you know, in their elder, older men, you know, 20, 30, 40 years old, and these are kids in their teens or younger, and they'd refer to many men as, as Papa or Baba, as they say in Swahili. And, you know, what did I know? I thought, well, is this an example of polygamy, perhaps? I didn't know that, in effect, um, there's a collective sense of fatherhood. There's a collective sense of motherhood so that when you're saying mama to someone who's not your biological mother particularly in more collectivistic cultures you're basically showing respect and acknowledging that that person could conceivably take care of you if your biological mother abandoned you now the reverse of that i discovered decades later when a um, i think it was a syrian refugee here in the united states uh was basically noticed that a, an American child was, you know, I don't know, about 90 feet away from, or more than, maybe a little bit more away from her mother, and she went up to the child to basically, you know, comfort her. This is a child she didn't know. This was like her collective mother responsibility. And the American mother went berserk thinking that the, you know, the child was being perhaps threatened with kidnapping. Um, it was just a totally different approach to this is mine as opposed to this is ours. And, you know, we're all, many of us are familiar with the term, you know, it takes a village. So, you know, when I, when I came back from Kenya, after having all of these extraordinary experiences, I said to myself, you know, I want to see if I can encourage other people from the United States to experience other cultures. And so I got into the whole field of educational exchange, wanting to send as many U.S. Americans abroad as possible and welcome as many students from other countries as possible uh, as a kind of an educational commitment. And uh, for that reason, uh, I then had the, the good fortune of leading groups to France, uh, to China, to many other parts of the world, which enabled me to help facilitate conversations about difference differences that on the, uh, on the surface seemed very, sometimes even threatening, uh, when they weren't intended to be that way at all. So let me just pause there and see if that leads you to other questions or to zo zoom in on that topic. Oh, well, yeah, it does. And I want to cover a couple of things that you talked about. Uh, the first one was the hand-holding. I experienced that in Thailand when I was there. 
But they don't do it with adult males. It's teenaged males from yeah, 12, 13, 14 years old. They hold hands with their best friend. has nothing to do with sexuality. It's just that's what they do. This is my best friend. And they walk through the shopping mall and they're holding hands. The, the hand holding disappears, I think, once they get into sort of high school, late teens and stuff. I, don't, I didn't see it um, with, with kids that age. The other thing that you brought up was the collective versus the individual. That took me some time to get used to when I went there because we as Americans particularly, but in Western culture, I think, generally, we stress the value of the individual. We always say, ah, you can be whatever you want. It's your life. You have control. You're your own boss. Um, and, and the phrase that I keep hearing is, in, in the West, we say, the early bird catches the worm, means be the first one, be original. And in, in the East, in Thailand anyways, th their theory or their saying was more, the nail that sticks up gets hammered in. That's right. You know, the Japanese have a similar proverb. Yeah. yeah. And when I was teaching, I found that very difficult because if I asked a student to stand up and give an answer or something, they would always look at their friends and they would always look around the room to make sure that they were giving the answer that would be the right answer. Not because they thought of it but because that would be the collective answer. And trying to get them to think on their own was a damn near impossibility for me <laughs> because they, <laughs> they just were not trained as kids to do that. When they grew up through the elementary schools, it was, uh, I am the teacher, you are the student, you copy what I do, you know? Right. And there was right. n no... Uh, critical thinking skills at all and that was real hard for me particularly I was teaching at the university level so it was really a challenge for me but what I found ironic was that the religion of Buddhism which is the main religion in Thailand is a very individualistic approach to spirituality and I always thought that Western culture and Eastern culture had the religions mixed up, that they should be Christians and that the, the West should be Buddhists because they match with the, the, with the society. Right, right. Well, just to pick up on this, this reminds me that uh, in recent years I've been doing training uh, on trying to help people in various contexts to understand um, a different culture with which... With which they are about to experience or they are experienced. So, for example, I was um, doing a workshop for Korean journalists, most of whom had never been to the United States before, and I thought, well, you know, first let's see how they experience uh, three or four days after they arrive here, difference here. And so I gave them an assignment to spend the day observing, walking down the street, going into uh, supermarkets, going into hotel lobbies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And when, I, when they came back the next day, I said, well, what did you see that you really rarely or if ever saw in your own country? And almost to a person, there was about 12, 13 uh, uh, Korean journalists there, they would say, you know, so, we're kind of surprised to see so many Americans, we, who appear to be Americans, to be walking alone, sitting alone, eating alone. Are you mentally disturbed? <laughs> that would be the question. That was the question they asked me, you know. And I know that when American businessmen um, and business people first went to uh, China and they wanted to, to go out to eat, some of them would want to get a reservation and they'd ask for a table in a restaurant for one. And this was just, you know, kind of counterintuitive for not only the Chinese, but most collective cultures. I suspect it was similar in traditional Thailand as well. And the Chinese would just, you know, you know, if you go even into uh, restaurants that cater primarily to the Chinese in Chinatown, for example, in big Chinatowns in the United States, there are all these big, huge round tables, which are for intergenerations. They're for the grandfathers, right. the parents, right. the children. 
the idea of having a table for one or two is counterintuitive to collective culture. Now, of course, <laughs> they've made adjustments, and you do see both. You're beginning to see both. But now in China, you know, it became obvious with more and more Western business people going to China that if they wanted to encourage them to come back to the restaurant, they have to start to launch single tables for one or two or three people. This was completely at odds with their reality. Or Americans who, when Walmart first went to China, they could not realize why the Chinese didn't love Walmart. And after a while, it became increasingly obvious that Walmart, the food products anyway, initially were primarily processed foods. Right. Well, in in Asian cultures, generally, you know, people like to eat fresh fresh food. Yeah. A chicken that was just killed, uh, farm products that were just, you know, harvested. So that was, um, you know, another lesson of how this plays out in different contexts or uh, let's say, and let's say, uh, even diplomatically in the business sense, Bill Gates, when he first went to to Korea, he was greeting the president of Korea, and he didn't have a tie on, and he had one hand in one pocket, and he shook hands with the other hand, and this was the front page news in all of the major Korean papers, and people in Korea were insulted. They felt that he's not showing any respect to the person in authority, to our president. Yeah, right. And the same yeah. and the same thing when an American ambassador, I think he was a former governor of Washington who was an American of Chinese heritage, he was uh, the name escapes me now, but um he went to China it must have been about 15 years ago. I think this was Obama's uh, uh ambassador to China. And uh when he got there, he was he brought his kids, his kids were <laughs> carrying knapsacks, his wife was pulling a um, you know, the luggage on the ground and he didn't have a tie on, and the Chinese were mortified. You are representing the United States, and you are coming here in such casual wear. He didn't have any. There was no ill intent here, or that he went to Starbucks and ordered his own coffee. You know, when you're coming from a hierarchical culture, other people do these things for you. Right. Uh, right. Uh, so you know, it was another example of misperception, and you know, who are these crazy people, as perceived from both sides. I think that's a very common thread in Asian culture because I've seen that in Thailand. I've seen it in Japan. Um, I've been to Hong Kong several times. And, you know, you were talking about the food. Let, I want to go back to that one. Even <laughs> the way the food is served, it's all served on giant platters and everybody shares. When we go to a restaurant, to a Western restaurant, we order our own, our own dish. You know, you're having a steak, right. you're having the chicken, you're having the fish, and everybody gets their own plate. Now, you wouldn't necessarily eat off of the other person's plate unless it's your wife or your kids or something like that. That would just be rude. But in the way Asian food is served, it's served platter style, family style. Everybody takes a bit of the rice, a bit of the meat, a bit of the vegetables off of these giant platters. And... <laughs> it's funny about the eating alone thing, because when I was teaching, every time we had the lunch break, it was my, uh, I don't know, my habit, if you will, to just go and sit somewhere alone and eat my lunch and just whatever I was doing. But they would always invite me to eat with them. They all ate together. All the teachers ate together every day. And it took me a long time to get used to that. And finally, you know, me being kind of pig-headed, I suppose, or set in my ways, I just said, look, I appreciate it, but I, I would prefer to eat alone. And they took offense to that. They thought that, oh, well, what's the matter? He's, he's too good for us. He doesn't want to sit with us. And that's, that's the attitude that I got from them. Yeah. And, you know, even, in the, even while there are broad... Uh, contrast that one can draw between Western and Eastern approaches to a whole range of things, uh, eating and food and um, politesse, everything. Um, even within Western cultures uh, and within Asian cultures, there are big distinctions. So, for example, I lived in France for four years, and I remember, um, you know, I was brought up, like I assume you were as well, uh, when you were at the table, people, the host or hostess would often say, serve yourself. Right. You take, yeah. find what you're going to eat and how much and etc. 
So um, when I was in France, this was really kind of striking to me that in French family, it's very common for the person who's sitting next to you to serve you before they serve themselves. The idea of them serving themselves before serving the person who's sitting next to them is counterintuitive. Uh, so even like within France, which is a highly individualistic culture in many ways, uh, you know, if you don't start debating right away with somebody, uh, <laughs> you're, you're not in the spirit of the conversation. But nonetheless, in in terms of eating, it may not be the, the collective plate that you're referring to as you experienced in Thailand, but it is a sense of, may I serve you, your, your neighbor, before you serve yourself. It's a consciousness of other. Um, and then you mentioned Thailand. I, I, I spent some time time. I spent some Thailand in Thailand. <laughs> I spent some time in Thailand. It's a tongue well. twister, I know. Yeah. And um, you know, in most parts of Asia, it, people are reluctant to say no uh, because it's it's um, it's confrontational. So yeah. they'll find indirect ways of saying no. And I, um, in having these discussions with Thai colleagues who are into, involved with intercultural communication, you know, they pointed out that. I think there's up to 12 different Thai smiles, and certain Thai smiles mean anger. So showing obvious disapproval to something, now, of course, there are extremes, uh, we know that, but in, in the general course of things, there is a smile that indicates disapproval. <laughs> I didn't know this. There is a <laughs> smile that indicates anger. Yeah. Uh, and there's another one. Yeah, and there's another one that indicates embarrassment and shame. Yeah. And it used to piss me off because my students would come in late. Some of them would come in late. And they'd walk <laughs> in in the middle of the classroom. And instead of, like, trying to cower into their seat like we would do and make yeah. as little, uh, draw a little attention to themselves as possible, they'd come in with this great big smile on their face and walk in with their chest puffed out. And, and I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, what in the world, right? So... Right. I, and I learned that, that that's the one that means uh, sort of uh, humility, shame, sorry, I'm late kind of thing. But it's, right. it's completely opposite. There's another one in India that's really interesting where the head movement, when they shake, <laughs> when they shake their head from side to side, which we normally consider to be no, that means yes. That's right. In southern <laughs> India. <laughs> Actually, uh, if this is of interest to you, Head bobbing also has a multiplicity of significance. There are nuances to how the head is bobbed. Uh, anybody could do a couple of YouTubes on this head bobbing in India and their significance. It's, uh, but the, the one that confuses Westerners mostly is the one that means the obvious of uh, yes, with meaning no. Right, right. Um, yeah, the smile thing in, in Thailand is, is really incredible because, I mean, they, they coin that phrase, the land of smiles. For Thailand, what they don't tell you <laughs> is all the different meanings of those smiles. The other one I wanted to hit on real quick, and then we'll, I'll let you get back to whatever we were. Um, you said something about they don't like to say no because they mm -hmm. consider that confrontational. I had invited the group of teachers that I work with over to my house for a party because I had just got there. Uh, you know, I was in a rented house, and, and I thought, you know, why don't I just throw a little party and just put out some buffet food and have everybody come over and we can enjoy, you know, our company. And so I, I went to the, the head of the department, and I said, listen, you know, would you ask everybody if they can come over on whatever day it was, Thursday at, at uh, 7 o'clock at night? And, and he came back to me, and he said, oh, I'm terribly sorry, but, you know, people are busy. They have other things and whatever. And I said, okay, no problem, you know, not a problem at all, I understand. So that night, I went home, and I took a shower, and I changed and put on my grungy clothes, and I'm laying in bed watching TV, watching a movie, just about ready to fall asleep, when all of a sudden I hear six cars pull up in front of my house, and it's all of them, and they're all ready to party, right? And I said, you know, I opened the door and I'm like, you know, half asleep. And they said, I thought you guys weren't coming. You told me that you had, you couldn't make it. And they said, oh, we thought it was rude. So we decided to show up. <laughs> well, now who's being rude is what I thought in my head, right? You know, you gave me no warning. 
that you were coming. <laughs> so I had to like go and get dressed and splash the water in my face and, and try to be, you know, and they were bringing whiskey and they wanted to drink and, and I, oh God. So that was a mess to say the least. Yeah, would it be interesting to kind of find out what was, why did they not respond favorably in the first place? Did you ever get a sense of the reason for that? Well, no. No, I didn't. I mean, I didn't inquire any further, like, you know, what was the mix-up. But I I think they just fell back on their cultural thing about no, you know, and and said... Oh, "Oh." right. I see what you're saying. Yeah, this reminds me of one of the earlier experiences I had in Kenya where I, you know, usually here in the United States, if a neighbor moves in down the block or you know, close by, you might want to invite them over for a drink or a cup of coffee or some tea or a short meal just to get to know them, show a little hospitality, welcome to the neighborhood. So I was stunned in Kenya that um, my fellow Kenyan teachers never uh, invited me over. And um, so I decided to invite them over. And they came, and it was a very lovely evening. We exchanged all kinds of stories uh, about our respective countries and cultures. And then my expectation was, well, now maybe they're going to invite me over. Nope. Um, You know, I was all going through the narrative that I was brought up with. And then finally, a couple of months later, because they were always pleasant to me uh, at work, I said to them, you know, we went, (laughs) we used to socialize in the bar because there was no televisions there. There was only one phone in the village. This was back in the late 60s. Um, I said to them, you remember that evening we had dinner at our house, at my house? And they said, oh, yeah, that was a lovely evening. I said, well, how come you never invited me to your house, houses? And they looked at me in shock, total disbelief, and they said, well, we don't invite people because the door is always open. Ah. <laughs> so I, I tested this out, and indeed, Doug, uh, you know, if I would go to a fellow, uh, a colleague's home, At any point in the day, it didn't matter whether it was 9 in the morning, 4 in the afternoon, 8 at night, the door was open and they started cooking. So you just could (laughs) just show up any time. Yeah, I had to stop visiting because I couldn't eat that much because it was an insult if you didn't eat. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) It's a little bit different, I found out, in, in Thailand and also in Japan because they normally don't invite people to their homes because their homes are not suitable for entertaining as far as they're concerned they will always take you to a restaurant and and that i found interesting that it's just you know uh, particularly in japan because people live in these little tiny minuscule apartments that are like the size of a hotel room and you know to have people over just isn't very practical so they generally will always take you to a, a club or a restaurant or somewhere somewhere else but uh i i haven't heard that one about in kenya that that's funny though so you could just show up anytime you wanted oh definitely and actually if you think about it in rural parts of the united states that's probably there's probably people who would you know as long as they know who you are yeah yeah come on in you know come on over (laughs) i think i think small town small town usa yeah would be like that but you see, in France, um, it also you would socialize in restaurants or cafes. The idea of, of being invited to a French person's home, they'll do it, but that is a sign that you are really friends now. You know, uh, it took okay. me yeah. many, many months before I would establish a relationship that would permit a French person to invite me to their family's homes. Uh, so a different reason, a, different con- a totally different context. But, you know, these things can have much more, you know, these are amusing anecdotes and they help raise awareness. But, you know, um, with all of this globalization and people crossing cultures without context, um, I don't know if we have a a little time to talk about immigrants in various countries and what they experience without context. Um, Yeah, we can, we got about 10 or 15 minutes left that we can use. Uh, Okay, so let me just give you a couple examples about immigrants and uh, and obviously it's a big political issue, but I'm just talking about the cultural issues right now. And that is, let's say you've got immigrants who are re- refugees who've experienced torture in their co- countries, right? Yeah. And they are very depressed when they when they come to a Western country, be it this country or parts of Europe. And the immediate assumption 
for many Westerners, they need talk therapy, right? We are raised with, if you're emotionally distressed, see a counselor, see a psychologist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And quite frankly, Doug, I'm from New York City. If you weren't seeing, this, seeing a psychologist or a psychiatrist in New York City, there was something wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> you <know? laughs> and even uh, the big tsunami um, many, many years ago in South Asia, uh, Westerners sent psychologists over there, and, and the response was, I don't want to talk to a stranger. You, f- you folks feel more secure in... Um, revealing your most private uh, thoughts uh, with a stranger. But we don't want to reveal those things to a private person, to someone we don't know. Um, And that was a huge and continues to be a huge misunderstanding here. Uh, Health, the whole issue of health. You know, in many Asian cultures, I suspect you saw this in Thailand, they do cupping or they do coining where they, they, they try to pull the toxins out of the body. This is a, a medical belief that's widespread in, in parts of Asia yeah. by pulling on a hot cup. Right. Yeah, so when, that. That, when Americans or Westerners see that here, their resp- immediate response is, oh, the kid or the person's being abused. The husband hit them. The wife hit them. The child is being beaten by the parents. No. It's a total misperception. These things are going on today. Today. I've, I have Asian friends here, who, I mean, Americans of Asian descent, who still do cupping, and they have told me how people think, who hit you? Did you do that to your child? So, you know, uh, yeah, it's a big topic, but, you know, it, it's, uh, it plays out not only in amusing ways that we can kind of de- deconstruct it for a little time together, but uh, it can also have serious consequences. Let's start to get into any viable solutions because personally I don't see any I mean there's just there's too many things you, we talk we were talking about the more whimsical things like the smile and the the, the head nods and the, the the collective plate of food versus the individual portions okay but those are little funny humorous things that we can all kind of dissect and laugh about but when you get down to things like religion and language and cultural history, people who are trying to preserve their cultural history. Those are serious things that people aren't going to just give up for the sake of globalization. And I don't even see where we can start with this. I really don't. We've, we've been fighting one aspect of that or another since we became human beings. And I don't see it getting a lot better. I really don't. We have we have progressed scientifically in terms of eradicating certain diseases, but since since we eradicated uh, typhoid and, and smallpox in the Western world, we're now dying of other things like obesity uh, because we're we're eating too much. And we've just changed what we die of. Uh, granted, we're living longer, but people are living longer with less, uh, with in poorer health, I should say. Yeah. But in terms of trying to get the world together, uh, where do we start? Okay, so let's start with the individual, if I may, as a as a Western individual, for the most part. <laughs> Good place uh, to you start. Know, uh, you know, I got into this whole world of international educational exchange because I saw how much I could benefit from experiencing being immersed in another culture, learning another language, just as, you know, you you eventually started to raise your own awareness in Thailand about these differences. So in, when I speak to my fellow uh, citizens here in this country about their contacts with people from other parts of the world, uh, particularly now immigrants, The first question I would say to them is, don't, you know, withhold judgment. And what you might want to do is discover, you you might be able to discover a little bit about their reality if you ask them the question, what do you find different here that you don't, don't find in your own country? Don't ask them to make a judgment. Don't ask them to say, what don't you like, because that's polarizing. What do you find different? And that begins a conversation on an individual level. From a more... Um, institutional level, uh, as you probably noted, I worked for a very long time, not only in international educational exchanges, but I ran an institution called International House at the University of California, Berkeley, which, uh, believe it or not, has close to 600 students from 80 countries and 25 U.S. states. 
And it's not just a dormitory. It's a learning laboratory where people are actually discovering each other in a natural way by living together. So let me give you an example, one of many that I write about in my book, uh, of how that human connection of people from very dramatically different, let's say even religious backgrounds and political backgrounds, can come together on some level. So at the International House, where you know thousands and thousands of people have been transformed over a very long period of time, we, there's a program office which develops programs with the staff and with the residents to bring people together to do things in common. In that program office, one year that I was working there, there was a Pakistani gentleman, a Muslim, who was working as a program assistant, a resident, and there was a Filipina Christian also there. Despite the fact that all these wonderful intercultural training things were happening, they, she wouldn't talk to him. She would not talk to him, and she would not talk to him because there is a whole big Muslim extremist terror group in the southern part of the Philippines. So what she took from that was, I don't want to talk to any Muslim, right? right. That's it. They're all finished. I don't want to speak to them. And so here she is in a multicultural institution that is devoted to intercultural understanding, and she won't speak to him, and they were both working in the program office until she got sick. She got sick. And when you get sick, when you're living in an international house, you don't go to the dining room. Somebody brings you food. Well, you see where I'm coming, Doug, Douglas, going with this. Who brought her food that night when she was sick? He, he did. did. He knocked at the door. Yeah. She was so stunned that this person that she had vilified in her mind just because he is a Muslim and associated him with Muslim extremist terrorists, she was so stunned that that was the beginning of glorious friendship. This was 25, 30 years ago. They are best of friends today, Douglas, today. Wow. So I've often said to myself, to often to open the mind, you have to first touch the heart. I can differ with you politically. I can differ with you with regard to um, religious belief. But if we can somehow show decency to each other and respect each other's differences, now I don't claim that this is going to cause world peace and make everybody the same. Actually, I think that would be kind of boring. If we were all the same religion, all spoke the same language, I think we'd probably discriminate each other based on different shape of eyebrows. But <laughs> the I, main I thing yeah. I would be looking for is many more institutions like international houses, which are increasing, actually, on university campuses where people are living and doing things together, but also domestic exchanges. Let's take this country, and I'll, I'll kind of conclude with this example. A long time ago, I worked for AFS, which was uh, American Field Service. And originally, these were started by American uh, ambulance drivers in the First World War to start exchanges. But not, they were not only international exchanges, they were domestic exchanges. So I, if I had a little more influence today, I would be really pushing to not only relaunch those, but to start them on a massive level, having kids who are in high school, even, you know, middle school, spending a semester, a year, living with a family, urban family to rural families, rural to urban. And, you know, you might have somebody from a very... Uh, "Quote unquote progressive background," saying, "You know, I'm I'm really I want I'm very strong for gun control." Send it to a kid uh, family in in Nebraska with big gun owning family, but big hunters, and all of a sudden, yeah, okay, my parents have a different view of this, but you've been awfully nice to me. You see what I'm saying? Domestic exchanges they do exist. I'm saying that they need to be amplified. International houses, intercultural living places need to be amplified. And the reason I think it's more urgent than ever is because social media is driving these and deepening these, what I consider to be toxic bubbles. Yeah. Echo chambers, tri exactly. tribal behavior, whatever you want to call it. Yes, you're absolutely you right. I agree about exposure to other cultures because when I came back from Thailand, I had completely switched my political views. <laughs> I, and... <laughs> It, just from living over there for three years. And I, I thought, well, okay, that, that was certainly a, an awakening for me. The problem I see, and let's make it specific to America for the, for the sake of this conversation. Okay. I see America turning into something akin to the Tower of Babel right now. <laughs> and, and the reason is because we are not... 
there isn't a defined thread that's going to weave into our social fabric that everybody who comes here as an immigrant grabs onto and becomes a part of. It used to be a hundred years ago, 150 years ago, when all the Eastern European, Jewish, Italian immigrants were all coming through Ellis Island, they became Americans. They changed their names, a lot of them. They decided to speak English. They adopted our cultures, uh, our traditions, everything. They wanted their kids to grow up to be Americans. Okay, I don't see that happening as much anymore. I see there's more of a push for people to come here, retain their old country values, but also to not, and I hate to use the word assimilate because that has very bad connotations, but there has to be something. There has to be a thread that weaves all of us together as Americans. Because if we don't have that, we're going to have anarchy. And I see it already happening in this country. And like you said, social media is just adding fuel to the fire. Everybody's, you know, collecting in their little groups and their little bubbles. And, oh, if you're a Democrat, you hate the Republicans. If you're a Trump supporter, then, you know, I mean, and it's just I've never seen it this bad in my life. I mean, I'm a little bit younger than you. Well, a little bit. Um, But. When I grew up, it, it was not this bad. It really wasn't. Right. So I don't know. That's, that's, for me, just the survival of this country for our democracy, I think, depends on something that's going to bind us together. Now, what that is, I don't know. I don't know. Well, that's why I say I think it's, you know, ways to foster a, a mutual discovery, uh, you know, discovery of our common humanity um, you know, in the, it is true that, I, we have to remember this, that, that when Italians first came here, they weren't even considered to be Caucasians. They were, they were not, you know, you, you go back in history and you look at how they were received. They were not white people. Um, and the Irish, when the Irish came here, they were also stigmatized in terrible ways. Yeah, particularly in Boston. Up. Yeah, I'm originally from yeah. Boston, so I know that story. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. you know, eventually, you know, there has been a commonality in over a couple of generations. But, you know, it's interesting. What I, what I really appreciate about, one of the things I appreciate about our country is, you know, the Italian-Americans still celebrate Italian uh, festivals, and they retain a certain aspect of their identity and are still considered, you know, your U.S. citizens. The Scandinavian, uh, the, those Americans of Scandinavian descent out in, uh, you know, Minnesota, um, in the upper north, middle west, uh, you know, they, they're considered U.S. Americans, but they, it's not that they shouldn't have um, lost touch with their cultures completely. So, you know, I'm a little bit, maybe it's my hope <laughs> that maybe another two generations, um, Many of the recent immigrants will begin to become, you know, uh, assume much more of a common core, um, while not denying their roots. Uh, so, I'm not as pessimistic as you are, although I think we're fighting against the roaring river with the social media, and that's why I'm saying we have to encourage many. I mean, we are living still with all of the progress we've made in race relations in this country. I mean, there's plenty of still problems that out there. I mean, when I was growing up, you would not see a black person in a commercial, except for Aunt Jemima. Right, right. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see black anchors. You wouldn't see, you know, I remember, uh, you know, Sidney Poitier, this was a big scandal when he was in a movie with a white woman. Nowadays, that's not such a big deal. So that gives me some hope that people who, of different backgrounds whether it's ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, can find a way to engage with each other. When that synagogue was bombed uh, several months ago um, up in, um, I think it was uh, in Wisconsin, I mean, the Muslim community there came to their, you know, came to embrace them. And I think we all have to recognize that there's good and bad in every community, that the line between good and evil, between... Um, you know, it does not go between nations and ethnicity and color. It runs right through the human heart. But the only way you discover that is by living together. And I'm, 
I'm sad to say, but I still think we live in too many segregated communities, not segregated by law, but segregated de facto, segregated schools. That's not a healthy situation. No, but the segregation isn't so much racially as it is financially. Both, right. yeah. but they have it has implications. One can be, in some cases, in many cases, connected to the other. Well, that's true. Uh, so I am sorry to hear that you are a little, to put it mildly, a little pessimistic about the future. But listen, <laughs> if we don't have a little hope, it's like giving up. <laughs> oh, I Pursue haven't. Your hope. Yeah, I haven't given up. I just, I, I don't see the bright light, perhaps, but, uh, Joe, we got to wrap this up. We are okay. just about out of time. Do you have a website that you want to give out for your book or yeah, personal I website? Mean, it's basically perceptionanddeception.com. One word, perceptionanddeception.com. It's on Amazon. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I have a feeling that people are really curious about, m- most people who have read the book have said, hey, wow, I didn't know that. That was exciting. So if people are interested, uh, I hope that they'll dive a little deeper. I'm constantly diving deeper. This is why I, I remain interested in this world, because I, in this whole area, because I continue to learn from people who are different from me. Thanks so much for coming on the show. This was a nice conversation. Very interesting. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for having me. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Douglas Coleman's Don't Do a Podcast is a dryly humorous rant about Douglas's pet peeve, the unrelenting torrent of podcasts hitting the web on a constant basis. As technology has put podcasting within the reach of anyone, many wholly unqualified people have taken the plunge. This witty polemic tries to persuade them from broadcasting their drivel using Douglas's brand of sarcastic humor. Now on Amazon, only 99 cents. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. Heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Hi, this is John Morgan, Production Supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome to The Douglas Coleman Show, Susan McClellan. Hey, Susan, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show. So you are an award-winning investigative journalist slash author, yeah? Is that your official title? (laughs) <laughs> I guess so. Um, I'm a, a, a journalist by training, um, having worked uh, in, in in Miami and for magazines, and uh, and a book writer. Yes. Okay. Do you know um, Hank Philippi Ryan? No. Oh, all right. Well, she's got the exact same job as you. Uh, in, okay. <laughs> in Boston, she's an award-winning investigative journalist, also author. Um, okay. I had her on the show uh, a while ago, maybe, I don't know, four or five months. 37 okay. Emmy Awards. Uh, she's pretty big time, I think. Um, wow, wow. All kinds of stuff. Very nice woman. So I didn't know if, you know, this was like a, a social club that all you guys knew each other or not. <laughs> no, but I'd like to get to know her. 
Well, uh, if you just Google search Hank Philippi Ryan, uh, okay. there's a whole interesting story about her name and because uh, that isn't the name she was born with. But I'm glad she changed okay. it because seeing the name she was born with, she was good to change it. It was one of, <laughs> one of those okay. unpronounceable names just about. But uh, anyways, so how did you get started in investigative journalism? Um, well, I was studying in Miami. I was at the University of Miami and working at the Miami Herald and interning at the New York Times. And I just, it, 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 I just was always drawn to, initially I actually wanted to make films, documentary films. I just was always drawn to telling the human story. And it was actually, you know, just like my book writing, it was a fluke. I was doing uh, just a very light story, I think, for the, the Herald, uh, one of their neighbors' section, which is their community newspaper, uh, about the difference between American and Canadian Thanksgiving. And the Thanksgiving is much earlier. And likely it has to do with the, the you know, it's colder up north and, you know, the season, the harvest season comes later. But I was interviewing the, the consul um, general in Miami and she let it slip that the bulk of their cases was, um, the bulk of their work there were dealing with drug smugglers predominantly female, um, that were being used as, as drug mules. And um, I thought that's a great story. And so I got permission to meet one of these women. And I really, really, really respected the time she spent with me, the honesty of the story. She didn't want her name. And, you know, maybe I was wrong, but gave her too many concessions, you know, sort of controlling the interview and whatnot. But it turned out that she was so happy with the piece when it was public that she told all the other women that were in the prison about me. And then all of a sudden I had about six or seven uh, female drug mules uh, wanting to share their story, use their names, and even giving me very concrete details about the actual roots of their smuggling. So that's how my investigative uh, career started off. And, and mostly it's always been about just gaining great trust with people that lead me quite far down into stories. I do remember once someone saying to me when I was working in the newsroom, now of course I work at home, um, you know, we'd love to have your Rolodex. And I was like, here, take it, take it, take all my contacts. <laughs> Those were years in the making to get that trust. They'll talk to you, but they're not going to talk to you the way they talk to me. So um, I just feel very, very blessed that people have um, trusted me with uh, their stories. Are, do you have a regular... A TV gig, or are you strictly uh, writing, published, or? Oh, I'm. Yeah, no, I'm writing. So, I the the book that I've just got coming out by Bloomsbury is the the story of a um, Holocaust survivor, a boy from Buchenwald, but it's very different Holocaust story in that it starts after liberation and really follows his and the other boy's healing journey because uh, when the Americans liberated the Buchenwald concentration camp in Germany uh, on April 11th, 1945, they found a thousand boys under the age of 18 that had been sheltered by the camp's underground, predominantly communists. And um, I felt that, that that was the story, is how did those boys end up becoming who they did because those boys one was an advisor to JFK there were business leaders one was the chief rabbi of Israel L.A. Wiesel that won the Nobel Prize these boys that were written off uh, as you know sociopaths that the trauma of what they had seen and experienced they would never lead functional lives and they actually the vast majority of them did and so I, I wanted to show um, in the book, 427 of those boys actually were sent to France for rehabilitation to a home there. And so the book is really based around the life in that home um, surrounding one of the boys um, who is still alive, Robbie Wiseman, um, probably one of the last remaining Buchenwald boys to be alive. How did you find out about this story? 
I've written, this was my ninth book, and almost all of them, all of them actually, have been working really closely with my subjects. And so a literary agent who knew of my work and knew Robbie's story connected us, and that's how it, it came about. So he, you said he's still alive. He's got to be in his 90s yeah. by now, yeah? He, yeah, he turned 90 on February 2nd. Wow. How is he? I mean, he's still sharp? Um, no, and and that's sad. Um, just before COVID, uh, his wife uh, passed away, and I, you know, I I sat with them for, you know, weeks at a time. I would go out and visit them. They live in Vancouver, Canada, and so I would stay in their home. And she was, you know, they were inseparable. She she was part of his memory, and um, she died quite suddenly from a fall. Um, just mm. a few days after Robbie's 89th birthday. And then, of course, we've now had COVID. And in the book, Robbie does find some living relatives, including some cousins that survived the Holocaust. And he brought them to North America. And that last remaining cousin died from COVID probably, I think, in September or October. And so Robbie, um, he's suffered a lot in the last year. At the time, uh, he was okay to, uh, like, he remembered the story. He could tell you the story. Right? Oh, yes. We started working on this book about five years ago, um, on and off. And, um, oh, yes, he was very sharp then. But there's also other, you know, he started, sh he, sh he would share parts of his story starting in the 1980s of speeches. And then there were other people who knew his story. Um, I spoke to his relatives. There were also experts who... Uh, a professor at the University of Michigan, Kenneth Waltzer, who's been studying the Buchenwald boys and their life there for um, decades. And so I, I met with all them. I fact-checked as much as I could. And kind of eerily, I got um, the original documents, including, um, you know, documents that the Nazis did as they moved Robbie around from camp to camp. He was Jewish, I take it. Was he um, yeah. German Jewish, or where was he from? Polish. Polish Poland. Jew. He was oh, from okay. a small town in Poland called Skarzyszko Kamena. I hope I pronounced that right. I know <laughs> Skarzyszko I've got right. Um, and it was a very small uh, Jewish community there, very orthodox. One of your talking points that I want to hit on is, is uh, why Wasman waited so long to tell his story. Why did he wait so long to tell the story? Um, a few things. Uh, part of it was that despite our knowing collectively uh, at the turn of the 20th century, the importance of the psychiatric community, knowing the importance of childhood and trauma, um, certainly after World War II, uh, World War I and then World War II, there was a real collective understanding both for victims and also returning um, soldiers don't talk, don't share your experiences, just move on with life, push them away. And that's in the book, that that's what they thought was healthy for these boys, is, you know, don't think about your story, you know, forget everything that's happened to you. And Robbie only began to go public himself um, in the 1980s when a school teacher uh, was teaching his students that uh, the Holocaust didn't happen. And that ended up hitting the press. And Robbie said, then I have a duty to share my story. In fact, and this isn't just in Robbie's story, but most survivors will say that they were in the camps. They would say to each other, whoever can live through this has a duty and responsibility to share and tell everyone what has happened here. And so Robbie, increasingly over the years, started to tell more and more and more of his story. He actually would do a lot of talks with Leon Bass, who uh, he has since passed away, but Leon was um, in the African-American military uh, unit that went to Buchenwald a few days after liberation. And the two would do a lot of talks um, together about both their experiences of racism and, you know, persecution. Um, but it was really only in the last little while that Robbie felt the real depths of the story and um, and was ready to, to tell the full picture, um, which includes a lot of anger uh, and a lot of shame um, that, you know, he, he both lived and he was also anger, angry at his father. 
Um, so it was really putting that all together for him until he was ready to put that down. The two famous concentration camps are Auschwitz and Dachau, and uh, uh, Buchenwald I really had never heard of before. Is there any films, has there been anything made uh, regarding that one, or was, was there something unique about that one to the others? Yes. Well, it was a very large camp. It was one of the original camps. It was in Germany. Uh, it was one of the original camps that was actually set up by the Nazi party, I believe, in the early 1930s to house criminals and political, the, the communists, the political, oh, okay. political opponents. And it actually swelled to, you know, I think at one point, 80,000, I think 60, something like, it was a small city, um, but about 60,000 people were killed there. But how the boys ended up there is many of them were at camps. Um, and like Robbie, were put to work because they were tiny. Robbie was working for a German munitions company that, that was in Poland because his hands were tiny. He could get his fingers into the barrel of guns and, and whatnot. Um, but when the Red Army was coming in to the east and the Allies to the west, the Germans began wanting, the Nazis wanted to um, hide what they had done. So they were trying to destroy camps. They were sending Jews on marches, death marches. Um, but some of the boys and men that were could still work, they moved them into Germany. And the boys themselves were sent to Buchenwald. Oh, I see. Okay. I see Albert Einstein's name on this uh, on yeah. the bio. Yeah. When the camp was liberated and these boys were discovered, they were you know, angry at each other, they were fighting, they were stealing, they were beating each other up, they, weren't eat they were eating like they were animals. They were still eating with their hands, they weren't cleaning, and people really did write them off, thought, you know, they're not going to live long. Um, but this organization, the acronym of which is OZE, uh, that was originally founded in Russia to help survivors of the pogroms and then was moved to Paris, um, it had been helping hide Jewish children during um, Nazi occupation of France. OZE brought the boys, 427 of the boys, to France, believing that they could be rehabilitated. And Albert Einstein was a patron of the organization, one of the founding patrons, I believe, of the organization. Wow. Well, that's amazing. Because he okay. was brought to the United States uh, around that time, right? Wasn't he developing on the atomic bomb? I, I'm not sure. Um, I don't remember I know he the timeline. In the yeah. camp. Yeah, no, he wasn't in the camps, but he he believed that these boys could be saved. We've got time for one more of your talking points, and I just want to do this one. The parallel lessons for today's teens regarding finding hope after surviving trauma. Yeah, I mean, this is why I really was interested in doing this book. We, of course, in the book, we weave Robbie's backstory um, which is just astonishing. But it was how he moved forward and was able to put, you know, his experiences into some context so that he could live life again. And when Robbie gives talks, um, he's, uh, you know, in his house, I've seen thousands of letters from young people saying that, you know, he's, he's given them hope to overcome their own problems, um, to be able to you know, look at their own lives and what they're dealing with and, and have some resiliency that they may not have felt they had before. And that's what this story really shows. And, um, and, and, and really, I, I hope readers can take away with that too. Not just young readers, but adults as well. Well, it's certainly a powerful story, and it certainly sounds like something that could be made into an incredible film. Has there been any interest to do this as a, as a film? Uh, a little bit, but the book is just out, so fingers crossed that um, <laughs> it can be. It, it, it is actually a beautiful story because there are so many startling images, too. Um, when the camp was liberated, the boys were wearing all their, you know, pajamas, the concentration camp yeah. pajamas. And uh, some of the Jewish elders that were at the camp and some of the American army, they said, you know, we got to get these boys some clothes. And they found a storage room 
of Nazi youth uniforms. So when the boys are moving to France, I mean, imagine this picture. Half of the, about half of the boys are wearing Nazi youth outfits. Oh, God. And in fact, yeah. when they first entered France, the, the, the French threw stones at the train because they thought the Nazis are coming back. <laughs> And they had to pull the train over for a night, and some of the older boys and the the, the American military um, man that was with them, that was also a rabbi, they're painting on the side of the train, we are orphans from Buchenwald, where are our parents? So that the French didn't think these were Nazi kids coming back to their country. That's pretty amazing. Susan, we do have to wrap this up. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Do you have a website that you want to give out? I do. It's uh, smcclellan.com. Okay. You want to spell that real quick just so people know sure. how to spell that? Sure. S-M-C-C-L-E-L-L-A-N-D.com. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing this story. This story is amazing. And, uh, great. Thank you so much. I hope it does become a film because I, I think this is something I'd like to see. doesn't sound like it would be an indie low-budget film, though. This would be a big-budget Hollywood-type <laughs> film because th- there's a lot of stuff that would have to be, you know, have to be done. But uh, I, th- I think it would be a great story to be told. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you so much. I, I think to honor all the boys from Bukamal because they they all vast majority of them became really very you know family men uh, grandparents and uh, just humanitarians um, we need to remember them yeah absolutely